Allie's going for it. Hold that. <clears throat> well, I think that's that for that rifle. Good evening, and welcome to another one of our historical discussions. We've been discussing the Williams bullet, the evolution of musketry. Now we're going to take a step back and talk about the Manet ball, the mini ball, the mini ball, the Manet bullet. Um, as we've discussed in the mid 19th century, we're moving away from smooth bores towards an effective infantry rifle. And we talked about the process of moving from the musket, the smoothbore musket, to the rifle musket, to the rifle. Now let's talk about those projectiles. And we talked about the Williams bullet and how it was profound in the ways that it replaced the mini ball. Mm -hmm. But we never actually talked about the mini ball. No, and we assume that everyone has a working knowledge of the mini ball yeah, so coming in. We want to provide a, an interesting uh, history of the mini ball. And, and I was, I was interested history. I was interested to, to fill in what I didn't know about the mini ball. So let's start at the beginning. Let's start with when we're moving towards searching for a, a projectile for our rifle musket. Mm -hmm. That isn't just a round ball. Well, the first thread in the story of the mini ball, um, I would say that you could say it starts in different places, but I would argue it starts with a, a Captain Norton who was uh, stationed in India in the early 1820s. And he seized upon a new concept for making a rifle bullet work in a, on a muzzle-loading firearm by looking at the blow tubes of the, that the locals used around him in, where he was stationed in southern India. And most of them were these poison darts and, and blow guns. But the way that they had... So you could technically say the inventor of the self-obturating projectile was, was invented in southern India by who knows who, how many hundreds or thousands of years ago. But Captain Norton noticed that the darts that they used went down the tube very easily and very loosely, but when they would blow through the tube to shoot the dart out, it expanded into the tube and captured all of the wind from the lungs, and it, it came out with much stronger force. So that clicked in his head. And so in um, possibly as early as 1818, but definitely by 1823, Captain Norton had been tinkering and he thought he had solved the holy grail of the muzzle-loading weapon era, was how to make a rifle shoot just as fast as a smooth war musket. Because they had rifles in 1818 and, and bef long before. But the problem is the bullets, to grip the grooves of the rifle, had to be larger than the size of the bore. So you either have to tap an oversized bullet down the barrel, or you have to use a cloth or a leather patch. Yeah, the tapping, the tapping they, in the Afghan war, they actually talk about the Jezails, how they heard them tapping, those little tap, mallets, tap, 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 mm -hmm. tap, on the, on the sides of the hills and the mountains. So it, it, work but it takes a minute or longer to load and it's inconsistent and if you undersize you don't necessarily grip the rifle no not uh nowhere near as well and it's that's the challenge of getting a rifle musket to work is the bullet has to be a snug tight fit in the rifle and for it to have any benefit of the rifle grooves but loading that tight fitting bullet it was the challenge. And so Captain Norton realized, I've just noticed something from these blowguns. And so he designed a bullet that, um, it's 
been described different ways, and you probably had a couple different versions of it, but one of it used a piece of pith, and the concept was that when it fired, it would expand, and it was also an elongated bullet. It wasn't a ball. It was an elongated bullet. So was it conical? Like, it was, like, like, it was a conical, like a, a, a regular okay. mini ball, you could say. And he wrote it all up, and he presented it to the... the uh, officials in, in the British Ordinance, and they turned him down in 1823 because it wasn't a round ball. They said that the only projectile for military use is the best is a spherical round ball, and yours is an elongated cylindrical projectile. And that's We're why we see some of those first Brunswick balls are round, even though they right, have the belt. Mm -hmm. They still want this round projectile. But you can't blame them too much because they didn't know any different and this is something radically new. And they've been using brown best mm -hmm. since the 17th century. Right. Mm -hmm. And there's not a whole lot of impetus to change yeah. what works either. So we have Captain Norton mm -hmm. and then what's the next iteration? It's still British. Right. I would argue it's um, a guy named Greener. William Greener who was a British gunmaker. A prolific writer also and and he uh, like Norton he was a little bitter throughout most of his life yes for coming up with these concepts and being um, forgotten for the most part they, yeah they come up with these concepts and then you know they see them adopted in their lifetime but yeah. uncredited so so we have the greener and then um, what, what does greener really add to to the process. Greener comes up with a compound bullet, which is just a fancy way of saying it's more than one piece of metal. So it had two pieces of metal. It was an egg-shaped oval projectile. And in many ways, it was similar to the Williams bullet. We yeah, we, about mentioned, we mentioned him in the Because it has so. that tapered pin of a hard lead alloy or zinc or some other harder metal than lead and that fit into a cavity in the egg-shaped bullet. And so when it fired, that pin is forcibly driven into the bullet that expands it into the grooves. And he came up with that in 1836, very enthusiastically. And it, was, it shot quite accurately, especially for its time in 1836. And he presents this to the ordnance authorities and they test it and they turn it down because it's a compound bullet too complex. Yeah. It's made out of too many pieces and they said, no, we'll stick with our, our round ball. And then we move away from that and we, we start to see in where, when we trace the history of the Minet ball, two French captains. Right, we finally go to France. Yeah. Uh, the next one, and the, this guy deserves the credit for inventing the system that we now know as the, the Minier or the Mini system because he came up with it long before Captain Minier did. It's not Minier. And it's not Minier. It's uh, a French officer by the name of Delvine. And the first thing he hit upon, this is in the, the late 30s and um, 1838, he presented this to the French army. But it's simply a chamber in the base at the very breech of the rifle. And this chamber is a smaller size than the bore. And you would ram a regular round musket ball down the barrel. And it would come on top of the powder right at the edge of this chamber. And then the soldier would need to take the, a very heavy ramrod and smack that bullet down so it went from being a round bullet shape to more of a squashed oval kind of mm -hmm. looked like an uh, you know an M&M candy yeah. in the in the breech and you, the bullet was physically squashed into the rifle and that was simple so you didn't need a multi-piece bullet you didn't have to have any plug or cavity it's just a simple round soft musket ball and a fairly easy to make chamber in the base of uh, at the bottom of your barrel and it worked pretty good you know it wasn't because the problem is it, it depends on the 
consistency of the soldier smashing the lead. If he smashes it too far or not enough, that's going to affect. And this is where another thing goes. that we we talk about with muskets in the nineteenth century that you see people struggle with the question is the infantryman this drone or is he a professional and when you when you see people designing it they want to avoid user error in this in this era mm -hmm. and you know once we're we're moving out of that once we get into the 50s and 60s you start to see you know the, the infantryman treated as a professional he knows how to use his equipment but Obviously, with, with that design, um, it's rejected by a lot of the French authorities because of that. Right. It was adopted to an extent, but it, it yeah. by no means was the general issue yeah. weapon being issued to every French soldier. We see a lot of those rifles getting issued to like chasseur regiments, mm -hmm. but most of the line infantry doesn't see... Um, no, even, I mean, even, they don't even see rifle muskets in the Crimea. We see a lot of unrifled muskets right. in the French army. Mm -hmm. and, and most of the French rifles that were there, a, a great deal of them were still the, the earlier designs. Yeah. Um, but the crucial aspect of this, and this is Delvin's great addition, you could say, is that you could load this rifle as fast as you could load a smoothbore musket because the round ball was undersized. So it dropped down the barrel. And even if you've been firing and you have fouling building up in your barrel, you can still load this rifle as fast as you can load the smoothbore musket. And it does give you accuracy up, to, consistent, repeatable accuracy up to longer ranges. Because in a rifle that you, you were tapping, if you're tapping the first time, you're going to be really tapping the second time when you have fouling building up in the barrel. Right, and it also places the expansion of the bullet depends on something other than the bullet being fired. Yeah. It depends on the soldier. And soldiers, how much do you want to leave to the soldier, especially in the heat of a firefight? Is he going to remember to delicately squash that bullet into the chamber true and straight? So it had a, a deficiency, but Delvin, after he came up with this chamber idea, he's tinkering around, and he comes up with a new type of bullet. Uh, this is in 1841, and he, he writes that uh, he came up with a new type of bullet with a hollowed out base, and his great discovery was that the, he called it the rush of gas when the pieces fired, the pressure created by the explosion of the gunpowder expanded the bullet into the groove by itself. The soldier didn't have to tap it, it didn't have any plug or pin, it was just a simple piece of lead with a hollowed out base, and when it fired, it expanded itself into the rifling group. So this was Delvin came up with this in 1841. And uh, by 1842, it was trying to produce rifles in it. But um, the French army preferred another type of rifle by a, another French officer by the name of uh, Tovignin. And that became the Tige, right? It was the, yeah, Tige being the French word for stem or yeah. pillar. So instead of Delvin's chamber, and uh, Delvin even, uh, added to it by putting the bullets in sabos and different things because the trouble was making sure the bullet got squashed exactly the same amount every time because otherwise you would have different aerodynamics on every single bullet so but uh, he tried sabos and other things to get it to work better but the TJ rifle by Tobin Yin worked much better and that was just a pillar of steel that stuck out of the chamber of the rifle and the soldier would tap the bullet down on top of that pillar and it would flatten the bullet and spread out the base into the grooves and off you'd go. You had a, a bullet fitted into the grooves. Same problem with Delvin's chamber rifle though. It depended on the soldier to tap it down and they were notorious to clean because you've got that piece of steel sticking out in the middle of your 
chamber. And the pin and in the itself had problems, no? The the stem? Yeah. Well, the co- it got in the way. Yeah. Um, the fouling deposits would build up around it, and uh, it just it was less than ideal, but again, it worked. So the French adopted those to a limited extent, and some of those would see service as late as Crimea, and, and some of them ended up in the Civil War. Yeah. But they're uh, both the, the Delvin and the Tovinian rifles are very scarce today because most of them were converted over yeah. to the, the standard Minier system um, after that came out. So finding originals today are they're they're very scarce. So let's finally get around to Minet. What does Minet add to it and does he deserve to have his name on all of these bullets? The only thing he contributes in the, the early 1840s is he takes Delvin's older bullet that was expanded by the rush of the gas and he adds a iron cup to it. Um, and the cup acts as a sort of wedge so that when it's fired, this cup is driven directly into the cavity of the bullet and it was a, it's an auxiliary to expansion, so it is a compound bullet because it's more than just the piece of lead. It's it's two pieces of different types of metal, and it worked. And in tests against Delvin's simpler bullet that was just expanded by the gas alone, Minier's system was slightly more accurate and more effective, even though it had a bunch of issues. And uh, Claude Etienne Minier, who was an artillery officer, and his the only thing he did was just take someone else's concept and add that iron cup to it as an auxiliary to more controlled, effective expansion. Uh, he knew that he wasn't the one who came up with it. In fact, in, in uh, 1855, he finally sat down with Delvin and they reached a, a gentleman's sort of agreement <laughs> that we will call this system the delvin Minier system, with Delvin being the first, first yes. and then delvin Minier. But of course, but then the cat is out of the bag. Yeah. It, was, it was Minier, 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 because Minier not only got his bullet adopted, but he got his rifle adopted as well. And the advantage of the Minier rifle was um, it had no chamber, it had no stem, it just was a regular barrel, and the bullet could be loaded very easily. It was undersized to the barrel, so it could be loaded just as fast as a smoothbore musket, and it expanded itself when it fired. And the Iron Cup was never very satisfactory because sometimes it would get blown through straight through the bullet yeah. and then it would leave a nasty ring of lead in your barrel and it wanted to fall out in flight which posed a hazard if, if you're providing support fire to friendly troops and you're firing over their heads you've got these erratic little iron projectiles falling from the yeah. sky so and it has the same issues with fouling as we see in the civil war right not as severe as the what would be known as the burton bullet but uh, because the Iron Cup did, for all its faults, force the bullet to expand fairly immediately mm -hmm. in the barrel. But that was, <laughs> that was Minier's edition in the late 1840s. But finally, he does deserve some degree of credit because he was the one who got the first rifle adopted that with no chamber, no pillar, no patch, no oversized bullet being tapped down. It's a standard, simple rifle barrel, and you're just ramming the bullet down and firing. And then that translates right over to the British Army. Right. The British adopted in 1851. They even called it shameless. Yep. They copied the French rifle because yep. there was a one of the periodic war scares in, uh, in Britain when the French adopted the Minier rifle. And the fear is that these rifle-armed French troops are going to invade, and we're going to have Gotta a smooth have our own. brown bess, and it's just like the, the French in the in the warrior. Right, the 
you know, yeah. a few we years must later. have better rifles. So the British obtain a copy of, and the when the British were deciding what they're going to replace Brown Best with, they tried everything. They tried the, in fact, that would probably be a good conversation to have later. Is but that's the, a different episode, right? Yes. But they they tried everything though, yeah. including the Prussian needle gun. But they essentially took a French mini rifle and copied it right down to the caliber. They kept the everything the same, and they adopted it uh, as the pattern 1851 Minier rifle is what it's known as. The the difference with the British was that they formed their bullets by compression, so they didn't have the uh, Tamisier grooves. Yeah, let's talk about the Tamisier grooves. Because people incorrectly French refer right. to them they're, as, as they're grease, grease rings and yes. blue grooves is what they're, okay. they're commonly known as. But again, it's not that's, while that's a there. side effect. Right. And in fact, the uh, and I brought this out, this is a Minier cartridge. So when, when Claude Minier came up with his iron cupped bullet in the 1840s, this is what they were being fired in. So the bullet was wrapped in the cartridge paper and the paper formed a patch. So the powder got poured and then the entire cartridge was inserted into the muzzle up to the level of this lubricated portion. So the lubrication is on the paper, it's on the not paper on the, on the, the exterior, correct. And that, the powder cylinder portion gets snapped off and the bullet gets rammed down the barrel, still wrapped in that lubricated paper. And the grease on the paper will soak into the gunpowder fouling of your previous shot and it softens it and it enables it to be more readily cleaned out when you fire it off. So it has a self-cleaning effect. But putting grease in the rings of the bullet would be pointless because there's the bullet itself isn't touching the barrel. So what was the original point of the groove? The uh, Temisier discovered that bullets with these rings on them fly more accurately because of just how the, the aerodynamics of the wind going over the bullet. So mm. it was designed to make a more accurate bullet and not to hold grease or, or uh, lubrication. So they are not lube grooves They're for, not, for uh, the Americans out there. No, but they serve that purpose, yeah. uh, especially in the American service. With the American system. When they were shot without any paper patch. The British dispensed with them entirely because by forming their bullets by compression, um, they flew accurate enough. But the British still kept the iron cup. So let's them. talk about that for a minute though. We have some bullets are cast and some are formed by compression. Mm -hmm. So with the compression bullets, we have cast cores. So as a, 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 a raw bullet as it were, mm -hmm. or you have lead rope. Right, it was just... And then, it's, and then it's pressed so that it's consistent. Mm -hmm. So that, are there yeah. any other advantages to having the compression? Yeah, you get a perfect bullet, perfect size, perfect weight. Um, and instead of when you're when you're casting, even if you're very very careful and you're doing them one at a time, they're gonna the bullets are gonna have flaws. Uh, if only because when you cast a bullet, you're taking lead at six or seven hundred degrees and it cools down as it cools down it cools down from the exterior in and you get vacuum bubbles in the lead it, it's inevitable you it, it's going to happen so every single cast bullet will vary in weight from one to another and it's going to have those differences in balance so the there's going to be a vacuum void bubble somewhere in there are multiples. The compression bullets, they're formed in dies, so the lead gets, comes in on a lead wire, it gets cut into little chunks and gets fed completely by machinery. This is all automated in, in the 1850s. It's uh, uh, remarkable for the era. It's fed into dies and it just takes this lead and smashes it 
into a die and the excess lead came squirting out and out popped a perfectly formed bullet of exactly correct size, weight, dimensions, everything. It's, and it's identical in every way to every other one that was made. So and the British completely did away with those grooves. Um, right. But the French kept them and then that was adopted with the American system. Mm -hmm. So with the French Manet system and the British Manet rifle, that all sees service in the Crimea. Yes. And we Extensively. see... Extensively. Yeah. It's in the British, we see P-51s and P-53s, um, and we see the the Pritchett bullet, or the Manet style right. expanding the, the, plug. The Pritchett bullet makes its in, first appearance in the... In the Crimea. And those are used in all of the, the rifle muskets there. Yes, but the Pritchett bullet is not a Minier system. The Pritchett bullet expands by um, a principle called upsetting. So all the, the Minier style bullets, whether they had a, a plug or a cup or nothing at all, like in the case of the American bullets or, or Delvin's original design, they expand by the force of the gas pushing against the bullet, either against the iron cup or plug or against the interior of the bullet itself and expanding it. The original Pritchett bullet simply had a, a slight hollow in the base, not a deep cavity like the, the Minier and Delvin system had. It was a, just a slight hollow and all that did was serve to lighten the base of the bullet. So when the original Pritchett bullet is fired, it just gets squashed down in the barrel and it fills the grooves. Now, and we, that system did not last very long in the British service at all. No. It lasted uh, only a couple of years. Yeah. And then experience in the Crimea, they went back to the tried and true iron cup from the Minier system. And that was controversial in itself. The Minier system was never very popular, even um, after it had been adopted. It had lots of critics. Uh, Colonel Lane Fox, who wrote the British um, musketry instruction manual, like, so he is the guy on musketry training, um, couldn't stand the Minier system. Um, we called it a, f a fallacy. Um, and was a big fan of Pritchett system, which had no cup, no plug, it was just a simple piece of lead. And a, a bunch of others in Britain and elsewhere did not like the Minier system um, because Iron Cup, problems with it, and there's other systems as you get into the mid 1850s that were demonstrably just as good, if not better and more accurate. We see the Minet used quite a bit in Crimea, and we see the French army adopting it more and more. We see more and more units issue Minet rifles. People are watching that. The, the military advisors of the day are watching that, mm -hmm. and we see, as we've talked about before, McClellan and Mordecai, the Americans, are over mm -hmm. in, uh, in Europe taking notes during the Crimean War. And I love that he, uh, and we have some of the photos of uh, his notes on the cartridges. He takes note of all the different cartridges being used by the different European armies. Mm -hmm. Now they don't listen to all of the uh, lessons that they might have, have learned along the way in the Crimea, but we see that American fascination with the Minet system and not necessarily um, guiding towards the British, but you see an affinity for the French system. Yeah, and by that point, Minier was already a household name, and it's William Howard Russell is to blame for yes. that, because he's writing home as the Times correspondent in the Crimea, and he is just vividly praising the Minier rifle in the British and French service. He calls it the king of weapons. It's, he it's not, it's, you can't blame him really. I mean, for someone to have witnessed 
you know, the 93rd stopping, stopping a cavalry charge with those rifles. Yeah. Um, um, or, or the French, uh, the uh, French doing their somersaulting over the... At Ingerman in particular, yes. uh, when the Russians attacked, he says that the Minya rifle smote them like the hand of the destroying angel. So it's very... That's weird. an interesting quote. Yeah, it is. <laughs> Make a great title for a book. It would be a great title for a book that's available on Amazon, and the link is in the description. But it, his writing was being voraciously read in the United States, too. But the Crimean War is the first major European war since Napoleon, so everyone's interested in it. And there's this new Minier rifle, and it's, um, it enters the public... Or, or, just it enters the vernacular that any rifle musket that shoots a self-expanding bullet becomes a mini rifle and the bullet that comes out of it is, is a, a mini, mini ball. ball whether it is or it isn't so since we're on this side of the Atlantic the United States Army wasn't blind to this you know they sent uh the uh, Delacour commission over with McClellan and Mordecai and, and Major Delacour to the Crimea, but several years before that, starting as early as the as, or 1852, they were holding experiments at Harper's Ferry as to what should we use as the bullet for our next military rifle, because the, um, the Model 1842 smoothbore musket we knew by uh, you know 1852, France had adopted the rifle musket. Britain had adopted a rifle musket. Writing's kind of on the wall. We need to figure out. We need a rifle, and so they start testing these various different types of bullets. And they're the master armorer at Harper's Ferry. It's a brilliant man named James Burton, and they conduct experiments. Um, it was actually under the direction of a of um, Ben Hooger, who would, would later be a Confederate yes. general, ironically. But they're testing all of these different types of bullets. So they test the Minier system with the Iron Cup, which was the first one they test. And they try the, the British-style bullet, the original Pritchett bullet. But Jim Burton, while he's tinkering with a bunch of different bullet types discovers, and I would put discovers in quotation marks, yes. because he's really stumbling upon Delvin's original 1841 discovery of a bullet with a very deep cavity and, a, and thin walls around the bullet. That doesn't necessarily need a plug. That doesn't need a plug, doesn't need an iron cup, and it expands itself. So they start testing this, and it, it's called the Burton bullet. It, by all rights, should be called the Delvin bullet, but, you know, history's a, yeah. a fickle thing. It's not a Minier bullet, because the only thing Minier ever did was add an iron cup to it. And these so once you take cups. an iron cup out of the bullet, it is not, by definition, a Minier ball. But, because everyone loves the French military in the 1850s, with their red pants and their somersaulting, this is the Minier yeah. ball. But it had just entered the vernacular yeah. so completely. So when Burton designs this bullet and it's tested and it's found to be superior in accuracy to all the other types, and of course they mildly fair uh, tests where they don't use the plugs. Oh, they. Um, <laughs> It's the American army in the 1850s, very small, very low budget, and the people doing these, and I, you know, as an ordnance officer, I, I'm, you know, don't want to take pot shots at my own forebears, but they didn't really know what they were doing. And the case in point is they started testing the British Pritchett bullet, and they decided we're not going to use the paper patch that was used in the British service. So they made up all of these Pritchett bullets and they were just 
astonished at how badly they performed. But that's because not how they were there was nowhere yeah. for the lubrication to go down on them at all. Yeah. So they, they decided, oh, this new bullet that Burton has designed is, uh, is superior. And it had the added benefit of being very cheap. No plug, no iron cup, just a simple piece of lead. And it could be formed by compression by machinery very simply. So the U.S. produced these as compression bullets. Oh, they, 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 were, they, were, they were not they were cast. Made, they were not in, in the American service, no. Um, were they the, cast the, when, they, when they entered Confederate service? The Confederates did. The Confederates did not have the, the machinery to form them by compression. So the Confederates, when they were making the Burton-style bullets, and they didn't do it for very long or very much. They, uh, they transitioned... Now, was it you who were telling me the Americans made a lot of the machinery for the British compression? They did, and in fact, all the the infield rifles are made on American machinery. That's fascinating. Um, yeah, the, the Ames Manufacturing Company of Chicopee, Massachusetts, yes. made the machinery that made this Pattern 53 infield rifle. So we're already making the machinery to make rifle muskets yeah. in, in the early 1850s. But the small American army is not adopting it yet. No, we didn't adopt the... We adopted the model 1855 rifle musket. Uh, when it first entered service in 56. And what is that fire? What bullet? It fires the, the, the Burton the bullet. bullet. Okay. Or the, the Delvin. And, and so this Burton bullet is as we talked about in previous episodes, not incredibly undersized. No, it's 5775, 0.5775. And it's being fired out of a, uh, a nominally 0. 0.580. And this barrel. isn't paper patched. The lubrication is on the bullet itself. So instead so of the grooves formed handy, convenient, double purpose yeah. to hold your lubrication. But it's not the primary purpose. But instead of it being in a paper cartridge with the lubrication on the outside, it's in an unlubricated paper cartridge yep. where you pour and then take the bullet out right. of the cartridge. The only thing the cartridge becomes is uh, it's a sack. Yes. It's a sack lunch. It holds your bullet and your gunpowder together in the same So you should, in piece. theory, not have any paper in your bore. When, you, when, you've, when you've used this entire cartridge... No paper no. goes down the board. No, and in fact, if you did inadvertently get some paper stuck between the bullet, you're not going to get it down because the bullet fits yeah. too tight. So, no, the bullet was loaded naked, as they say, with no paper on it. But this went down in history as the mini ball, when it's not, and it's not, not only is it not a mini ball, <laughs> it's not a Burton ball either. Yeah. He he rediscovered something that twenty years before Delvin had discovered, and it uses a similar concept to um, Greener and Norton came up with twenty years before that. So let's talk about the Burton Manet Delvin ball in the Civil War in the context of the Civil War. We start out with it being. 0.5775. Right. And then they try to use them in Enfields. Mm -hmm. And and they don't that work. doesn't work because they're they're too large. The Enfields were 577. Yeah. So then and the, the, the Northern Army is importing them by the hundreds of thousands because as the um, the Union Army expands from 30,000 soldiers to half a million in in only a span of months, there's nowhere near enough weapons for everyone. So they start importing hundreds of thousands of British P-53 infield rifles that the contract makers in England, in yeah. Birmingham especially, just more than happy to make. And they churn these things out. And they're, we, we're, both sides are importing muskets from all over the world. Oh, yeah. I mean, they're, they're importing um, Belgian-made Lorenzas, mm -hmm. um, French rifles. And of course, P fifty threes, and even even the reboard uh, P forty twos that we talked about before. But um, so then we go to the undersized Burton ball. 
Right. And, and drop the caliber to five seven four. Okay. So that it's serviceable in the in the five seven seven infield. And the downside of that is that it inevitably creates a great deal more fouling right. in, in because that, it, uh, it does not expand instantly when it's fired. It's got a lot of ground to cover. When it's point five seven seven five, it's got one half of one thousandths of an inch that it has to expand. So it can cover that distance very quickly, immediately on the gun being fired. When it's dropped down to 574, well now you've got six thousandths of an inch that it has to expand. And it does not have, crucially, it doesn't have that plug or iron cup that the or pin. British or pin that the British and the French used to uh, as, as a wedge to force the base of the bullet to expand. So you start getting fouling building up in the bottom half of your barrel very quickly. That's why uh, modern black powder shooters know if you're shooting a, and, and the most common size today, uh, the most popular bullet molds you can buy today, either by Lee or by Lyman, they're the most popular makers. Both make a bullet and it's 0.575. So that again, you can use it in both the 58 and the 577 Springfield and Enfield, but it causes fouling. Yeah. And uh, we know when we go to the range, in fact, I can't give these away. Uh, was it, it was last year sometime we went shooting and I had maybe 20 rounds of, of Burton Minier cartridges. And I'm like, does anyone want these? No. Nope. And I could not give them away. Here's free ammunition, free lead, and free ammunition. If you have a clean bore, they're great. But if not. Yeah, but it doesn't stay clean for very no. long. And then uh, you get, in my experience, you get about 10 rounds off before the. And so what that translates to stuff. is in battlefield conditions, it's not, not incredibly reliable. No, it, it was in the 0.5775 and in a very well kept gun in ideal circumstances. Because that was how Burton designed it. If, if you had asked Burton, and by the way, he wasn't around at the start of the Civil War. He went and took a lucrative gig in England. He went over there to uh, advise them on their... It's lucrative to be an ordnance officer in the 1850s. Especially well, the, the whirlwind pace that things are changing. And the, the paradigm shift from smoothbore musket to rifle. And there's always the fear and the concern that someone else is going to discover the next thing that uh, the next um, advanced weapon or rebrand the latest old thing yeah that's going to make what we have obsolete and you see it constantly throughout the, the technological advancement in the second half of the 19th century especially in firearms was a whirlwind of, of development and what you had, let's just pick an arbitrary year of 1898, we still use the same exact thing today. Brass case, center fire primers, boxer, boxer primer. It's, the calibers have changed and the, the composition of the powders have changed, but it's the same thing. We have not improved on the standard military cartridge since about 1898. It's just, we adjust the size and, and uh, the details of them. So from 1850 to 1898, it's not very many years. No. And we go from this and, uh, you know, the soldier having to ram his bullet down the barrel with a stick to the modern cartridge. And so, yeah, it was a great time to be an, an ordnance yes. expert. As long as you were on your game. Um, and so when Burton designed his bullet, he never for a moment thought it was going to be used in anything other than the standard issue United States rifle. 
no one in their wildest dreams, least of all Benjamin Hooger, who was helping them with these experiments, knew that they were actually going to be fighting against the country that was designing, that they were designing this ammunition for. It was the last thing on anyone's mind. So we designed this bullet for a particular rifle and it worked very well under ideal circumstances with that rifle. When war came and that unknown variable of oh, now we're now we're using another country's guns in our war, it necessitated a change to the bullet. And then it goes from being not the Burton bullet to I don't even know what you would call the .574. You could call it the uh, <laughs> the <laughs> the, the ordnance the department type two. bullet. Yeah, the type two. <laughs> but this is what was used by the Northern Army exclusively from about 1862 until the very end of the war, mixed at certain points with um, a proportion of Williams patent bullets, a.k.a. Williams cleaner bullets. Nothing's, nothing's more hilarious than to say, oh yeah, there's... The, the mini balls came with Williams cleaner bullets. <laughs> it's both wrong. And it was a better bullet, but there is the necessity there, which it did have a, uh, a, a happy side effect of cleaning the bore for... It did, right, for the, the type 2 size Type 2 <laughs> Burton ball. And that's not the term. It's not a type 2. No. <laughs> So anything else to add about the mini ball? No, other than it's not. It's not. It's not. Uh, it is a process. We see mm -hmm. it move from the, the beginnings of expanding bullets in 1818 all the way to uh, Delveen. And then we see little improvements along the way. And then the final adoption with Burton. In America, yeah. and then dropping it down to five seven four, and then it, you know, it worked, and it, it worked well enough. This is America's bloodiest bullet, and it's unfortunate that we it, don't have a, a proper name for it. It's not a Minier ball, it's not a Burton ball, because neither Burton nor Minier had any input in the ultimate design of the you know the size 0.574 burton would have never adopted something like this in 574 because it would not have worked to his satisfaction it would have caused too much fouling and um, he was actually exploring compound bullets that used the the greener style expanding pin and that's when he came upon the delvin he, he rediscovered that uh deep Hello. And you might you might call these simple pieces of lead, but they really are, as I've said before with the Williams bullet, a fascinating piece of Victorian era technology. And these are these are pivotal in the American Civil War. They are the deadly bullet of the Civil War. They were. But these these two are a huge part of you know, the, one of the deadliest wars of the 19th century in Europe, the Crimean War. Mm -hmm. So it's a, um, it is a pivotal part of military history in the mid-19th century. And it was a very short span from, from Minier till the end of the American Civil War. So this is the 50s and 60s. And it was... It, I would argue it was even obsolete by the, the, before the end of the American Civil War. It was obsolete because everyone knew by about 1864 we're going to bridge loaders. We, and again, the technology was changing so fast, and there's a concern that if we adopt a new rifle, we spend the money on the infrastructure and, and the buying all, equipping all of our soldiers with this new rifle. Is it going to be obsolete in 10 years? And so everyone was hesitant to uh, jump headlong into breech loading technology because the technology was changing so fast. But by 1864, the British were already working on the Snyder. And um, 
you know, the, the death knell for the muzzleloader was the Franco-Austrian, uh, or the Prussian-Austrian War in 1866. Um, but so that's a, a another very, episode. A, a very short span of history. In 20 years, it went from being um, turned down as, as uh, you no, know, we, we want to keep our round ball in our army, yeah. to being adopted modified several times. If you trace it through the complex, I mean, we see the Afghan war, the necessity is there, but you still see the adherence to the smooth war musket. Mm -hmm. And then we see it crash onto the world stage in the Crimean War. And then it culminates yeah. in the Civil War, but then we're already moving on. The two takeaways I would leave is that it's... Um, the speed or the the short time in which this was cutting edge technology it, it appeared adopted obsolete um, not overnight but within 10 years essentially just incredible speed of technological transition and that is why to my second point pro that's why we have the wrong name for it, because it, it came. It had a new name every couple years. Yeah. You know, from Norton to Greener to Delvin to Tovinien to Minier to Burton to the Ordnance Department officials who decided we need to reduce it to five seven four. Just for simple. <laughs> That's true. A, a so common much. name. We're just gonna call it the mini ball. Yeah. Because to keep track of every of each little uh, incarnation of the self expanding ball would be a nightmare. It but it deserves, I think, to be called the the Delvine. Um, Minier rolls off the tongue easier and it's it's more easily anglicized to mini. So it is rather small. Probably why, at least in uh, in the American vernacular, all of these are mini balls. Yes. <laughs> but it's that is true of a lot of things in the mid nineteenth century. It is a transitional period, and this is what gets us that transition between the smooth bore and the small bore, from the smooth bore brown bass all the way to guns very similar to the ones that are being used today. So. Next, on our next video, I think we're going to discuss the Pritchett. Because just like the Minier, what most people call the Pritchett isn't. Quite. But that, again, is another episode. <sighs> Too many topics in so little time. Indeed. But thank you for your time watching us drone on about the Minet, Burton, or more properly, the Delvine, the Delvine Ball. Leave your angry comments below. <laughs> Indeed. Shall we await?